Good morning, good morning, good morning, and welcome to The Good Life with me, Eileen. We are here on Relationship Tuesday, and we are here to open your mind. Good morning, good morning, good morning. We are here on Relationship Tuesday. And Relationship Tuesday is brought to you by none other than the Gentilly Italian Pie, located at 4706 Paris Avenue. And today is $2 Tuesdays on tap. So make sure you visit Gentilly Italian Pie, which is home of the family happy hour, $5 wings, $5 personal pizzas, $5 drink specials, Tuesday through Thursday. That's 3 p.m. to 7 p.m. That's when you pick up your kids and they're hungry and you don't feel like cooking. Yes, dine in or carry out, 504-826-9180. That's 504 504- 4826-9180. And Uche, you're looking too comfortable over there. So I need you to come up to the mic and tell us what $2 Tuesday on tap. What do they have? I know my finger is Angry Orchard. I'm sure Angry I say that every week. Blue Moon, Abita, Amber, Rebirth, uh, which, which Rebirth, um, um, what's the word? Um, I'm for? Is delicious. No, Rebirth, <laughs> actually. Um, and nutritious. Is, is donated to Roots Music. Oh, wow. Yeah, so every, every Rebirth that is sold is money is to donate to uh, Roots and Music through Abita Beer Company. So, Imagine that. That is um, amazing. 7th Street Wheat um, and Nola Blonde. And then we have every all the um, Dos Equis, Negro Modelo, Coors Light, Bud Light, Heineken, Corona, Stella, Stella Sidre, Peroni. So we, so we can drink it for a cause in New Orleans. You yeah. know, that's how we turn up. So let's turn up on Tuesdays at Gentilly Italian Pie. That is $2 Tuesdays on tap. Make sure you are there because that is the good life. And do not forget, January 29th at 7 p.m., the good laugh. Relationship Tuesday is going up on a Friday. It sets off at Bullets at 2441 AP Toro. That is January 29th at 7 p.m. Tickets are on sale now at thegoodlaugh.brownpapertickets.com. That's thegoodlaugh.brownpapertickets.com. You know, come see what really goes on during commercial breaks. I'm scared. You should kind of be scared, too. Come see what really goes on. Make sure you're there January 29th at 7 p.m. That's Friday at Bullets, 2441 AP Toro, because that is the good life. And today... We're going to get into it, y'all. You know, obviously, yesterday was Martin Luther King's Day, and so we all had the day off, and it was a day for us to reflect. And I was, you know, flipping through the channels, and I was watching OWN Network, Oprah, and they had this uh, this documentary come on, and it was about where people are now. And she had this um, psychiatrist come on, and it was about 22 years ago, and her name was Jane Elliott. And she conducted the Angry Eye Experiment. And let me say, the Angry Eye Experiment opens your mind to living differently in the world. And that's exactly why I wanted to discuss it today. So I sent the video out to everyone on the panel. And so we are in the studio today with Gian, Ty, Brian, and Uche. And I just wanted you, I just wanted to read a little excerpt. It says, you're probably more racist than you care to admit. Most of the time, people are treated unfairly because of their differences, according to Jane Elliott's brown eyes, blue eyes exercise. Are people with brown eyes smarter and some people with blue eyes racist? During the blue eyes, brown eyes exercise groups, they're separated according to their eye color. The exercise proves that when people with blue eyes are treated the way that people of color, gays, and women are treated, they react exactly the same way. They get angry. This exercise has been done since 1968. Most of us are not aware of the contributions that brown-eyed people slash people of color have made to society. We live in a racist society and we are educated by a racist school system that only teaches us about white contributions. If we start telling truth in schools, we would not have racism. We could cure racism in this country. Racism isn't inbred, it's a learned response. You have to be taught to be a racist. This was Jane Elliott. And she actually started this experiment the day after Martin Luther King died, or was killed, I should say. 
because she was so impacted by it. She was like, how can I open people's mind to living differently in the world? And how can I put someone who is basically ignorant to the fact that racism exists? How can I put them in a position to at least acknowledge that it does exist so we can start having the conversation so we can move to some sort of peaceful existence? So I sent the, the video to each one of you and I'd love to hear your um, responses to the video before I kind of really get into some deep questions. Tian? Since you're first around the table, you're sitting, you're sitting in the number one seat. You're sitting in the number one seat, so you get it. I think the video had a really personal impact on me because everyone knows here my children are biracial, interracial mm -hmm. kids. And so I... So that's a, a different point of view for you. <laughs> yeah. I didn't even think about it until you said it. Yeah. Well, I didn't know that either. So I struggle with that all the time because, you know... Remember when I was on the show last time, I told you I was going to 2016, I'm living in reality. Right. Because <laughs> sometimes I don't like to. I like to pretend like, oh, things don't exist and that's not how it is today. Everything's and great. Everybody's like, except my kids because nobody thinks like that. And, and, you know, reality likes to hit me in the face, and especially when I watch videos like that with just day-to-day -day interaction with my kids and my family and even, you know, situations I had in my marriage when I was married to their to their father. And so I think that we try to pretend in today's society that those that, you know, like she said on the video that, you know what, you know, people say, they say liberals say, you know, I'm not racist on my friends are black right. or I'm, I'm not racist because I don't see color. And I think we like to kid ourselves and believe that that's how we really feel when we deep down inside, all of us have some type of prejudice. It doesn't mean it's racism. It's just some kind of prejudice to the situation. But I totally agree with you. I think racism is taught at home or not at home in society. And I think it's something that you have to address with your family. You know, because I talked about it last time, I think a lot starts at home. And you have to prepare your kids, your family, whoever, that, you know, people have their own views and they're not necessarily right. But you have to know who you are and be okay with that. And you only can change your outer circle and educate people and try to live your life in some way colorblind. Mm -hmm. You know, and so I am trying to figure out as a parent how I'm going to deal with that with my kids going to school and what group do they even fit in? Right, right. And especially in New Orleans, I think in New Orleans, we have so, you can kind of play the game in New Orleans though, because New Orleans, uh, with the broad array of colors in New Orleans that you can kind of play the game until your parents show up at school. You know what I'm saying? So it, it really does ride that fine line. Ty, what was your thoughts once you saw the video? Um, you know, I, I just want to challenge, you know, you know, G shouldn't have to, find a space for her kids to fit in. They should be in an in, you know, ideal world. An ideal world, yeah, right. They should be able to, to be comfortable in multiple different spaces. Why, why can't aspects of who they are innately and authentically as biracial children allow them to, to be able to blend and feel comfortable in multiple different spaces and groups and environments, right. you know? So just challenging that theory. I think for me, um, what resonated um, about the video and about the exercise and, you know, what Jane Elliott has been doing for many, many years, because I also checked out a couple of her other videos mm -hmm. uh, on YouTube as well, is um, the, the, what resonated the most with me is, is it's through experiencing you get a better understanding. Right. It is through experiencing you're able to seek understanding. It is through, ex it is through starting from a place of listening first. If you notice, she started off doing a lot of talking. She was explaining you know, hypothetical situation right. that we're going to do. And they were, they, they, each of the students started from a place of receiving information and they, and they were actually paying attention, attentive and listening. Um, and then it was through going through the exercise and experiencing what she wanted them to experience that a light bulb was even able, able to be touched, you know, and triggered. Um, and so I think that, you know, if we, um, created more opportunities to allow individuals to experience what other people actually have to go through. Walking be, in someone else's shoes for a day. Absolutely. That was only an hour, hour and a half. And Imagine a day. And quite often it happens. You know, there are a lot of large corporations when, you know, that have um, very strong employee communication programs mm -hmm. where there is a walk in your shoes day um, um, where one one um, department or field has to shadow another area to better understand what they do and how all of the pieces work together for the betterment of the organization. Right. We do that where we bring our children, you know, to work with us sometimes and, and they're able to see and shadow someone. Um, and most importantly, just imagine... Just imagine if our legislators would be required to mm. um, be a teacher for two weeks. Just two weeks. Right. 
by, by law, they were required to actually teach for two weeks where they wake up very early in the morning. They, they work the hours of a teacher. Before they want right? to go cut education. <laughs> they have to go sit in the classroom imagine, and imagine, see what goes on. Imagine what their outlook and their thought process would be right. when they're drafting legislation or voting, how it, would, how it could potentially significantly change the early mornings, the late hours, um, grading papers to 11 o'clock in the morning. They, they had to be to that child that had to stand at the bus stop at 5.30 and then go be shipped halfway across school, sit on the bus and have to sit there for a half an hour because you can't get off with no bus monitor and have to sit with the rest of the children on the bus. Imagine if your legislator had to go do that. Imagine having to adjust and meet every respective child where they are because of the backgrounds in which they're coming into the classroom, their experiences. You may have one child. With no heat in January. Or a child that's just ready to learn versus a child who clearly is going through something at home And you see that you don't have that child's undivided attention and how quickly you have to adjust and adapt and accommodate each of your respective children. I really do think that, you know, that could shed light on some of the unrealistic expectations that are placed on our educators. Absolutely. Brian, what were your thoughts after um, watching the video? And we are discussing the angry eye experiment in which Jane Elliott separated um, the classroom into blue-eyed and brown-eyed and totally... uh, Discriminate, discriminated against the blue eyed strictly because of their eye color. Go ahead, Brian. Good morning. Good morning. I think uh, Dr. Elliott's experiment, <clears throat> her experiment highlights the vast um, nature by which racism and discrimination permeates our society. And, and I think she does it in a, in a two edged sword kind of way. On one level, she takes um, to where she shows how easy it is to indoctrinate. And, and cultivate hatred very quickly and easily simply by bestowing privilege upon one group which follows the history of our country. And then secondly, <clears throat> she highlights the fact that we still have not done even a little bit of the heavy lifting right. and changing what our society has still dealt with, which is our original sin, which is slavery. And the fact that by, by creating a society based upon privilege and access and opportunity and information for one group of people simply based upon skin color, she highlights that we still haven't done the work because we still have to contend with that very issue today. So kind of as Ty said, why do we have to create this this space to deal with this? Because we haven't done the real work. Right. So, so yes, through all the years of Jane Elliott's work, through all the years of Tim Wise's work, through all the years of and deaths of Dr. King and, and excuse me, Mecca Evers and, and Malcolm X, have we really even begun to, to change that? I mean, we still have in our constitution that African-Americans are three-fifths a person. We still <laughs> right. have in our constitution that the Voting Rights Acts are still being voted on every so many years. We, we have not solidified the means by which equality can actually be achieved. So I think her experiment does justice, but it also highlights the vast injustices that still you know exist. Absolutely. Uche, thoughts on the video? Mm. The angry eye experiment, it's where they separate the classroom into the blue-eyed group and the brown-eyed group, and they actively discriminated against the blue-eyed group. Well, for me, it touched uh, it touched the area in my life that I had to go back, and it was very much intentional by my parents. I went to school, I went to all-white school, and I was the only black kid in school until my wow. brother came. Wow. The only. <laughs> wow. And my brother came was the two of us. <laughs> And for us, it was very much intentional for my dad to do that because he couldn't change our color, but he could show us what the world is like, to shine a light. And Mm. this is what the world is like. So you're going to go to school and get your education? Because that is education. Because this is what the world thinks of you. Mm. And when when you come home, you're going to get your Nigerian education. Mm. And I'm going to teach you about... The Biafran War and Kano riots, where my grandmother, my mother was lost life, brothers and everybody else lost life. A million people mm. lost in a war. Oh this my is gosh. and so this is the two educations that I'm getting growing up. So I'm getting my education at school, which is look, I'm gonna just put it out there. This is this is reality. This is this is what white people think about you. And I'm gonna have you around them every day. So you know what it looks like. You know what it feels like. You know what it smells like. But when you come home, you're going to get your Nigerian education also. So I was fortunate to have the two. And that's in the first time I'm I'm seeing the Jane uh, Elliott thing. So, you know, but for me, it just brought up a lot of of things. And what she's saying, she was very, 
very, very right in the whole thing. But in everything for me, I love being black. So for me, it, it, it's just once you have that feeling and you, you, you really love who you are and you love your, your people as a, as a whole, you know, I, I, look, and some of my best friends are white, but I love being black. Absolutely. You know, Absolutely. and that's that's really that's really all I can say. You know. I mean, can I can I ask just I want to ask the panel this question: Is do you think that we sometimes forget the struggles that happened before, and that we try to sometimes forget that this world is still racism, and we still have these views out there, and we get caught well, up in our own reality, and we don't take the time to say this is really still going on because it's like oh well we we have advanced we have, we live in these neighborhoods you know we have all these access we don't we don't experience this every day because the world really still the same the way and I think sometimes even I fall victim to that that we get complacent we think oh things are not the same as they used to be well in what Gianna's saying she's a hundred percent right but the thing is is that you have to be educated to know that to know that it is real to yeah. know how to better prepare yourself and protect yourself so yes and what you're saying it's real but once you you've educated yourself. You can protect yourself. If you, if I know that you have a gun and I put on a bulletproof vest, then I'm protected. I can't protect you from carrying a gun. So this education that we're doing with each other and whoever's listening, this is how you better prepare yourself for things like this by being educated. Well, I thought it was very important, especially after Martin Luther King Day, to start this convers to continue this conversation because sometimes you know there's a lull. But I want to continue this conversation. We're going to go to the lines. We have Keith on line too. Keith, good morning and welcome to the Good Life. We are here on Relationship Tuesday discussing the angry eye experiment in which a classroom is separated between eye color the blues and the browns and how the blues are um, actively discriminated against and how they feel and, and you know the repercussions of that go ahead good morning absolutely i know i did Who? Absolutely. Thank you so much, Keith, for your call. We appreciate it. We are going to really delve into this conversation. You know, you are not born racist. You're born into a racist society. We're really going to jump into this process when we get right back for the break. Stay tuned. This is a good life, y'all. Did he say all? Oh, he did. I heard it. Elf? 
I was like, he was getting himself angry. I know. I was he like, um, so see, tell you for that stuff. That's what you're angry for. Yeah, but I'm gonna go four minutes over the break, so I'm already it's like, time to, it's time to stop being angry and start trying to, like, you know, to be realistic. And it's right. Right. realistic it and strategic. Yeah. Stop being anger. You get ignorant when you get angry. Thank you. You know, so stop you just can't do anything with that. Just let everything and just see things for what they really Please want. Please let's have that conversation. So Are we being this. recorded? I mean, right now on Spreaker. I'm gonna say this on F2 but yeah, one of the issues that I found is that What's up, Spreaker? Is that not only I don't think we're forgetting it, I think our parents and we talked about this about two weeks ago, our parents hope that we didn't have to do no, I'm saying. shit. No, okay. I'm no, 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 they did. They did. No, 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 I'm, not saying, I'm not saying they didn't prepare us. But there was also that seed of, I hope we are moving forward. And so what's happened is we, because we don't face it every day, we didn't face it every day. So Because, see, they of, were fighting for the law to be passed, right. for something to be law. And I think the part that we that our you know parents and grandparents were ignorant about was the fact that the law could pass, but you, you have to evaluate the implementation. Right. Well, you have to evaluate just, the deployment. Educating our kids. Like I said, right. I mean, my, at my children's school, they're not going to probably teach black history. No. They're not. They're no. not. No, they're not. They're not, right. they're not they're right. And they, your they, job. They, but I'm going to at home. But, but and I'm that, going yeah. to make sure that they understand. But that's just the thing. And, you know, because they feel they like to believe. You know, those schools like that, like they say, oh, we're not racist at right. the school, and we, you know, we don't right. have these issues at the school. No, that's just yeah, not, that's not, that that's not, not true. Yes. They're doing their job and educating their people. Right. 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 I'm just saying that they just, I'm just saying, like, well, in, the, at the campus in general, like, I've talked about race at the school, just in well, general, at, like, at, and they're I, like, oh, we don't have those issues at our school. All of course you do. Along, and, and it's all right to say so. Of course you And you know you have racist people. Right now, like, in my children's two-year-old class, they all, the children don't see race. That's the thing. It's like, they're two years old. They play with each other. They don't look at each other any different. They don't you know when they see race? Like when that racist says parents. Right? When their parents do it. Right. Like, oh, like what is he? What is he? It's who did you invite to your party? Who, yeah. who did you invite to your party? Oh, no, they can't come. Yeah. Right. So it started like for Newman. my daughter in about fourth grade. Yeah. And like Newman, third or fourth yeah, about grade. second or yeah. third grade. Yeah. You know, when you start being real social. First grade. First day of school. At Clifton Gators. Yeah. When a little boy turned around, oh, we have a nigga in our class. Yeah. Oh, whoa. Oh, yeah. oh, I beat the brakes off. That was. Yeah. I, I, think, I, think that that, I think they'll make more. They'll, when they'll I would, more when I would, but, no, but see, that's still a point, though, is that our parents hope that that shit would happen. No, us. my parents are like, it's going to happen. I, I, I'm, I'm <laughs> dipping you. <laughs> I'm dipping you in this Get right custom. now. Get used to um, it. And yeah. guess what? As a 42 year old man, I'm, th that, yeah. I'm thankful for it because now I sit at a boardroom table full of like this. And you know and, what they think. Like, what's happening? Y'all know I come from a very militant, yeah. socially conscious family. And my daddy dropped me right in Cabrini in the eighth grade and said, figure it out. And you know, if the, if, the, if, the, if, the, if, if what I experienced, you know, I'm extremely grateful for it because by the time I got to college, you know, interacting with white women and the games that would be played, Whatever. it was, it was, you, it I was knew how to, I knew how to conduct myself within that space. But let me tell you, let me tell you, uh, my daughter was in private school for four years and we were living in Baton Rouge. And it was in the sixth grade where they had, I think it was Louisiana history, it was Louisiana history, no, American history class. Mm -hmm. And when she brought the book home, she was saying something about slavery. So I said, let me see your book. I could not believe that in the entire book in American history, Civil War and slavery was two pages. Yes, but that's <laughs> the book had... Slavery was two paragraphs, but the Civil War was uh, like one chapter, but majority of it was more of the. Le I could and not so that's believe that's it. Side, and that's what but that's James Point Jane of Elliot, what, what a racist. Think, but that's what she highlights is that we can do these little experiments because it is a little experiment. Yeah. But we're not changing the whole society. So when your legislators, like you said, when your educators, when people who make these decisions are still racist, can't leave it up. But they have to. But you have to. But Brian, you have to accept your racist. That's just another thing. Like because a lot of people into the, our society, who we're all educated. We don't want to believe we're not racist. We don't. Yeah, always, but people don't want to accept that. Well, so you have to accept and, and, and that. And the deepest racism issues. comes between our own mm -hmm. race. I understand it, mean, but I'm, no, I, agree I was with waiting that. for you to say. I agree with that. I'm, I'm just saying in general that people need to accept their racism. They need but, to realize the that their racism. Racism does exist, but and, and you need to we talk as a about culture it. need to accept that racism exists between ourselves yeah, before yeah. we can even start looking at another community. Who in here doesn't accept that racism exists? Anybody? It's not bad, but we just want to pretend exists. like we don't act, we don't act, we don't do it. Like we're not. Well, I'm gonna give you a real world generation. That's why you live. I'm gonna give you a real world generation. The race and 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 race and
<laughs> you, I don't have the latest of it, I but what I do what know is do? the people that they pulled together was all black people, and then it was exactly. all it was all white, white people that are fighting for the cause. There was nobody in the room or on the committee. The people that we need to have a conversation with. I don't even talk to you about the struggle of being black. I know it is exactly. <laughs> and, I, and my kids can ride their bike, and, and people ain't gonna be speeding up and down the street. Because my neighborhood doesn't have a lot of black people, we don't have crime. I think we, we, we have a whole other show. I didn't move to where I live because of black people. Black of? I didn't say black people. She moved because that's a badass house. Ryan, <laughs> you, do you know the latest on? Um, didn't the mayor like receive some funding from the Serta Group and the Foundation for Louisiana and Flozell was instrumental in that, and they pulled together that race and reconciliation. Yeah. Co- What's it called again? I know the Erica's the, on um, it with the. That's Earth. what it is, like the race reconciliation group or the, um, something. I, I they pulled the, all of these people yeah. together to talk about race relations, right? But of the people they pulled together, it's not the people that are that are in a position of power that's actually. Y'all, in short, it's institutional move. racism maintained. That's called a circus. We're about to be live. Or at least live on WBOK. We've been live. Good morning, good morning, good morning, and welcome back to The Good Life with me, Eileen. We are here on Relationship Tuesday, and we are here to open your mind. We are here on Relationship Tuesday discussing the Angry Eye Experiment. It was an experiment by, excuse me, by Jane Elliott. She was born May 23rd, 1933. She is an American former school teacher, recognized most prominently as an anti-racism activist and educator. Ed- educator. She is also known as a feminist and LGBT activist. She created the famous blue-eyed, brown-eyed exercise, first done with third grade school children in the 1960s, which later became the basis for her career in diversity training. It goes on to say that you are not born racist. You are born into a racist society. President's Joint Council on Mental Health in 1959 um, featured as being the number one mental health problem among children in the, new, in the United States of America. They say no one wants to say the word color because no one wants to recognize differences. Differences need not be seen as a negative. It ought to be all right to be different. If you are raised white in America and you are not president, then it's a miracle. It means that the system has failed. The school system in this country is about maintaining the status quo. In schools, they teach white supremacy. Jane Elliott. What are your thoughts? We were just discussing, you know, the school system and how children aren't you know, innately racist. They learn that from society and society's, you know, teachings. And they learn that from us. And if we want to change something, we have to stop passing down this racist culture. And number one, recognize that it exists and stop saying that it doesn't exist between um, different races and between our own community. Because you can't start pointing fingers until you do some self-reflection. And there's a lot of self-reflection that we have to do within our own community. Mm-hmm. I'm going to shout out my home, my homeboy, Royce Duplessis, last night we had this conversation about what happens when people lose hope. And and to Gian's question around how do we contend with these issues if it seems as though we don't want to acknowledge racism or if we kind of pretend like it's supposed to have gotten dealt with, I think the reality of it is is for both African Americans and European Americans and any other group of people ethnically diverse in our country, the reality is, is that racism still exists. And we won't combat it, we won't change it until we put it on the table, we examine it, and we change it. Now, that means some people in some positions are going to have to get very uncomfortable. They're going to have to give up some access, some privilege, some power. But that's the point. And, and what we're talking about in one space is, is, to me, in my experience, is that my mom, through the work that she did, and she was sharing stuff like she met Dr. King. She had never told me that before. Wow. And she was sharing that as a child in New Orleans growing up. She was hoping that we wouldn't have to contend with the black only, white only for water fountains, that we didn't have to deal with the screen on the bus. And so she said, yes, my hope was that by you going to the schools you went to, you would have learned better, had a better experience. And then when I shared with her my experiences and how her training taught me to get through, it was good. But in the same vein, 
the only way to win a battle is if you know what you're fighting against. And so like Gian said and like Uche said, yes, by putting your kids and putting yourselves in those situations, you become battle tested. But the reality of it is, is I think there was a generation both of white people and black people who just hoped we wouldn't have to deal with this anymore. They thought the marching and, and I told somebody last night, too, I said, I'm not marching anymore. I am about real active changing of systemics and people. And if people are not going to do the right job, we got to vote them out, get them out, move them out, however we got to. You know what? As we talked about this during the break, and y'all, what you hear during the break about, you know, being children and uh, having those experiences and what our children will go through. But you know what? I want to throw this question out to each one of you, and I'll tell you my own. What was your, we've all had racist experiences, but what was that one experience that kind of stuck? I know, well, for me, it was multiple, I'm sure, for y'all, but was there one experience that kind of like stuck out more than the others? Yeah. For me, um, I went to, it, it was it was a mixed uh elementary school, Catholic elementary school, but there were tracks and I was the only black in my track. And so, you know, you, you went to library with your track, you went to PE with your track. So basically you stayed with your track the whole day. And so I was, I didn't have the, thank God, like Uche, you know, it was just you, but you know, for me, it was in my track. And so that's kind of the, the group that I hung with. And I remember, you know, it was, I'm gonna shout it out. Sorry, y'all. Valencia Uptown. You know, there was, you know, it was a party that everybody went to. And when I tell you they looked at me sideways for being there, I was the only there. And they looked at, at me sideways. And I was so uncomfortable and cried. I called my parents to come pick me up. And I never went out with them on the weekends. That was that age where I guess sixth or seventh grade where, you know, you start, you know, going out with your friends on the weekends and stuff like that. It was, it was, very uncomfortable. They made me know that I was uncomfortable and I wasn't wanted. And I called my parents to come pick me up. And I was like, I don't ever want to be in that situation again. And actually, I ended up leaving that school in seventh grade because of the racism. And it was so uncomfortable. My parents were like, I don't want you in that situation anymore because my grades had gone from like A's and B's to like a C's and D's. And they were like, that's not my child. Mm -hmm. But my parents were you know, paid enough attention to me to know that something was going on. And so, you know, what a blessing. But what, what about the children who don't speak up and, you know, who aren't getting that same type of attention? What was it for you? Probably for me was when in my high school, and I, I mean, I, it is what it is. I, I graduated from Ms. Dorn Newman. Somebody wrote in my yearbook at the end of the year, have fun in the ghetto. Oh, wow. I mean, I grew up in an all-black neighborhood, but it was not a ghetto. And I remember thinking, well, ah, you know, this person just made a huge assumption about who I am and what I am. And at the end of the day, you know, just reminded me that people can make assumptions about you regardless of what you're doing, how you're doing it, and what you're doing it at. So it just reminded me at that point, people are going to make assumptions about me. So I'm going to come and I'm going to bring it hard every day. And that's it. All right. Go ahead. Uche? Uh, I remember I was probably 12 years old. My mom lived in Biltmore, Connecticut, of all places, <laughs> on this gated golf course community. And me and my brother are riding our bikes, and this man pulls up, old white man. He's like... He's like, y'all know y'all gonna get in trouble for being back here. Y'all know y'all not supposed to be back here, right? What? And my brother looking at each other like... I live here. <laughs> huh? And that's what he's... And I didn't even respond to say... Right. I live here. We just kept riding our bikes, and he just kept following us. And he kept following us until we got home. Right. And then I always, as, as an adult, I always wonder what he thought when he saw us go home. Right. You know? after what he told us. So that was that was like the 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 joke. It was a joke, you know, like, man, it's, it's real. <laughs> you know what? Before, before I go to the um Gian and Ty, I wanna say something real quick because gosh, this hit me. Um and you know our children go through something, but it was the first time that I dealt with it with my child standing next to me. And it was two weekends, two Saturdays ago. So we are at a party for one of his friends at school, right? And so I'm going to just give you a whole story without saying the name of whatever. So Tanya Boyd Cannon was the entertainer at the event. When I tell you she was amazing, she was absolutely amazing. And she had her children there. Her daughter sung a song, Beautiful Voice. And her son was on the drums. I mean, when I tell you he was doing it, he was doing it, right? Now, my son is at a predominantly white school. It is mixed, but it's predominantly white right now. So we're leaving. And there's another uh, couple who's leaving maybe two steps ahead of us. He turns around and he says... Weren't you the little boy on the drums? You look like him. <laughs> what? They do not look alike. The only thing that they have in common is that they were both black. But Aiden turned around and looked at me and I said, don't even worry about it. <laughs> 
But to. this is what our children go through. And I was just there, glad that I was there to be able to have a conversation with him to make sure that he was okay. Because this is what our children, especially our black young, exactly, it's, it's life. life. And it's what you're going to have to deal with. Ignorance. You're lucky ahead, he Ty. said it. <laughs> right, right. Go ahead, Ty. Um, you know, to, to go back to your, your question, um, poor Aiden, but... <laughs> I mean, you know, life. right, um, it's life. I think for me, the most, uh, the memory that has stood out the most for me during my high school years, I attended a majority white Catholic high school here in New Orleans. And um, I won't lie, I had Saturday detention every Saturday for my first three years of school. Um, my father would automatically wake me up. I would pay my $10 <laughs> and, I, and I had Saturday detention. Um, um, and I had it so much that one Saturday I showed up and my name wasn't on the list. <laughs> and she you was like, like Miss St. Julian, I know you need to be here. <laughs> um, but nonetheless, um, I think for me was eventually, um, I cleaned up my act or I was, I guess, better able to adjust and conduct myself in a space that was very challenging for me because of how rules were enforced. Mm. Um, and because I grew up in the family that I grew up, grew up in that I'm extremely grateful for, I would speak up about it. I would call out um, teacher, teachers and how certain mm. rules were enforced. And mm. now as an adult, it's laws and so forth. Um, but I think for me was, um, was when I uh, tried out, um, I grew up dancing and uh, I wanted to be a cheerleader. Mm -hmm. And I desperately wanted to be a cheerleader. So I cleaned up my act, got my grades together, got my behavior together. I had a year and a half of no problems. So I tried out for the cheerleading team and uh, scored the second highest score. Wow. The only individual that I didn't beat was a young lady who could tumble. Mm -hmm. um, and then everybody ran to the board to see who made who, where you scored in audition and who actually made the team. Mm -hmm. And I noticed that. I scored the second highest score, but I didn't make the team. So everybody's like, oh my God, you know, what happened? What's wrong? You know, yada, yada, yada. So at that time, same day of the uh, cheerleading coach and the dance team coach pulled me on the side and said, you know, you, we, you know, we know you scored the second highest score, but as you can see, you didn't make the team mm -hmm. and that they were just uncomfortable with me being on the cheerleading team. <laughs> but in that very same hallway, in that very same conversation, uh, the cheerleading coach, I don't know what to call out their names because two of them are still at the school right now. <laughs> but um, not, nonetheless... I feel uh, if, if, if people want you to talk better about them, then they should have acted better than your lifetime. And so, and so... They I was can't keep your degree now. I, I was pulled <laughs> over. I was pulled over. Um, and she said, you know, you noticed that you, you didn't make the cheerleading team. Um, but we want to offer you an opportunity to be on our dance team. And we want to offer you a captain position. So I looked at her just how you're looking at me in <laughs> utter, aside, in utter <laughs> disbelief. Utter disbelief. Because I couldn't believe, okay, so I did everything I was supposed to do. You and on I conformed on paper mm -hmm. to the expectations so that I could qualify for the cheerleading team, scored the best highest score, and I still couldn't still be on the team. It. However, I was being offered an opportunity to be on the dance team without auditioning and was offered a – a captain position because you can entertain and <laughs> i truly believe mm -hmm. if it wasn't for my family and my parents and my upbringing that i would have probably said yes and was excited about that opportunity okay. right but i simply looked at both of uh the coaches and said you know what thank you but no thank, thank you. you and i walked off and at that point i was just done for the remainder of my high school years but i understood and I was happy and fortunate to be able to understood exactly what was transparency, transpiring while I was experiencing it at such a young age. Go ahead, Gian. Last but not least for a question. We, I, we're discussing the angry yeah. eye experiment and we are um, discussing about our, experience. our experiences. Yeah. I, I have one that kind of ties into my youth and my adult because it happened to me in both times of my life, which is very strange. Mm -hmm. um, everybody knows New Orleans East. And so I'll, do you need to take a break? Uh -uh, okay. Go ahead. So I, my we, lived, we moved in Lake Forest Estates when I was three years old. And at that time, New Orleans East was a predominantly white area at that time. So on my street, we were the second black family on my street. And so I well, multiply the neighborhood. Multiply the neighborhood. <laughs> and so while I was, our alarm went off in our house. And I walked outside and, you know, the neighbors had just moved in. They built a new house next door. And, they, and so they were like, oh, what's going on? So my neighbor walked up to me and said, what floor do you guys live on? And I, and I was like, I think I was like six. And I was just like, huh? what do you mean, oh, sir? This is our house. He was like, aren't y'all the maids? Wow. 
And my mom was like, my mom just looked mortified. And I was like, mommy, this is our house, right? And right. so. Wait, you're questioning your mother. Yeah, like, oh. So wow. he, <laughs> when they found out that they were living next door to not the maids, but this black family in this house, they put up a fence. So if you, I, I drive by still to this day and I look at that double fence and I'm going to show my children that double fence one day. I'm going to say they put that up because mommy was black. <laughs> and look at you so, now. So, yeah. Right. <laughs> so, so, and, and I'm mortified. So fast forward this quickly to 2014 when I bought the house. Mm -hmm. So every I bought I bought this house and the, it's important for me to say I bought this house and the guy who I bought the house from is incarcerated mm -hmm. he's in jail, right? So the neighbors come to tell me oh welcome whatever and they were like oh my god Mike would be flipping over his grave if he knew a black woman bought this house. He is in jail, <laughs> okay. <laughs> But oh it's 2014 and once again because I have something that some people receive I shouldn't have because I'm a minority then it, it, it must be an issue. And I just couldn't believe, I called my mom. I'm like, do you thing? know this neighbor told me that the guy who had the house, who's a criminal, would be upset because a black woman owns this house. That is and my neighbor thought it was okay. Like that was okay, that was to, okay say. to say. That was okay to say like, oh, okay. Like, you know, like the neighbor, the guy who owned the house was a bad person, but no, you're a horrible person for even You're worse than he You're worse than he is. <laughs> and so, you know, I know general. that we have to take calls and break, but I really want to discuss, because once again, in my world, in my reality, I'm thinking it doesn't matter what color I am. I'm buying this house. It doesn't matter what this neighborhood looks like, mm. who lives there. I could afford it. I'm buying it, right? It didn't matter. But sometimes every now and then reality kicks you back to say, this is really going on. Absolutely. That's exactly the conversation we're having today. We're discussing Jane Elliott's angry eye experiment, the brown eye, blue eye experiment. You know, we are all raised with some racist belief, even though we may not want to admit it. Is it possible to recondition racist beliefs? We're going to discuss that when we get right back. This is Good Life, y'all. Relationship Tuesday. These are things are not going on our door and ask my mom what she has to do with a woman of the house here. Say, wow. Yes, they did. Yes, they did. It's a woman of the house here. I mean, but oh, I'm gonna go. She got, she's out here. And I think that's kind of one of the things. I'm gonna go to the lines I'm first. Gonna, I bought my house in the I'm gonna go to the lines first. Gotta, I'm gonna I'm deal with that later. I gotta deal with it more of that. Stuff. Yeah. Um, but like, I bought my house in the intentionally. But everywhere else I've lived, I've lived in predominantly white. Oh. I like that shit. And I realized when I lived in all white neighborhoods, I was, well, where do you work, sir? And I said, I work at UWF. Are oh, you a coach? Said, no, I'm a doctor. <laughs> Why the fuck I got to be a coach? But at the same time, but, 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 the same time it's people like you. You do need. I'm not a coach. Right. We all doctors. We all this. And we all this. I, I, I don't, they don't even, they're so kind of crazy on my block. I just look at them and, right, they, but that's like, and I drive just, and I'm like, whatever, I don't care so what it's like Chris Rock said, though, he said, you know, it's fucked up in this neighborhood. His guy, his neighbor is a dentist. Yeah. He's an entertainer. The assumption is that white dentists can buy houses when you buy houses any day of the week. Yeah. But to be black, you got to be an entertainer. Yeah, you you, can't have, you have to do something yeah. that, right. like, you know. Extraordinary. Yeah. You got to yeah. dance. You got to tap dance. I mean, I, I think <laughs> that I have to take up some, I'm either, I, it was so, it was it was telling. One of, I had, you know, after my parties, a little right. boy came over and his mom said, you know, my son asked me, who is, is Deion married to an NFL or NBA player? What, you can't make your own money? And his mom, and his mom checked him like, no, this is her stuff. Right. Yeah, I got to tell you but, something, but, but I don't want you to, I don't want you to, I don't want you to look at my mom I'm crazy. No, I know, but I just was like, why do they think? My mom that? was like, I need a, I need to get me a man like Gian. <laughs> I said, no, this is all Gian shit. Thank you, my stuff. I said, this is all her shit. Though. But this little boy who was 12, I had to assume that the only reason why I'm black and I'm living here is that my family member had to be in the NBA, NBA or NFL. What did you do? I own medical clinic. Oh, okay. And so, she's the bomb. And so, but I'm just like, <clears throat> But that's the assumption. Like, and that's the assumption. I was like, and she was like, though. and she, and she, I was, I was happy to say, no, she's a business right. owner and this is her stuff. But, but even then, what happens is, is either his, somebody in his family is teaching that black people are limited. Yes. 
that black people can only have so much. And we just can't be entrepreneurs. Right. right. But ourselves. think. But let me challenge this. Think about how easily we circulate videos on our various different social social, social channels that make we as black people look bad, but we don't share the news of I, I when. Okay. I know, and I, but I'm, I'm speaking. <laughs> not right. right. But there's more. And the, more right. right. Yeah. Yeah. You're right. Well, with, you know, when, when, oh, when, 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 awesome. when triplets all graduated from Harvard Law School, four say. black males, they were brothers, but they see, graduated from Harvard Law School. Or when you had that whole class what's of... What's you want to know who's the hardest? We don't, we don't share the stories of our people. You want to know who the hardest it is to convince the, the that twins black were judges. people are excellent? Mm-hmm. Black people. Yes. <laughs> when I sit in my black site class right now, when I drop no, shit on them, like that, that moves up mine, they don't believe it. But I mean, I understand that. That's what I'm saying. Like, but that's because why we the self hate is so deep. But that, but, but that's what I said. If we have lines lit up, so we're gonna need to keep yeah. everything concise. Like, well, yeah, short I don't, I don't, version. You know, no, I'm gonna try to get them like short version. Actually, I'm gonna tell. But you. that's the point, right? Is that. We're fighting to convince white people, but if we can convince our own community, but if if, if, if we got some, we got so much self hate going on, you can't convince that. your yeah. community. You just can't do it, and it's difficult to convince because because we're not educated in our schools, we're not educated within our. If your parents don't know that they that you can't from kids that are educated in our schools, that they that you came from kings and queens and they able to pass down, then how do you embrace that? But 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 I mean, you just look at it like this. I mean, child, you know, from what country did my children go to school? He went to New York, and why all our parents sent them there? Because they ed- you know, because education. But I want to say, but black kids right now, they need to make a point of what I'm getting at the time. What I'm saying, St. Augustine is supposed to be. But they can't also. They can't also. I'm just saying, we're putting our children in all white environments. I'm going to ask them, like, yeah, I'm taking the doors open in here. It's like, huh? Well, outside of here, man. Well, outside of here. My mentees who've seen you, you're changing it for them. I know, who, I know who, change, but I know who you're changing. But the doors gotta stay open, though, and, and they're not gonna keep them open. The white people, I know, but I'm just saying, I'm just saying, for those who I know who's changing, but I'm a lawyer, you're changing that perspective. Mm-hmm. And I know it's hard because same thing for me in the black psychology, but I'm not gonna do it. No, you can't go ahead and do it. Good education, good education, and good education. strategic, and you know, tell how much is baby, though. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Hi, Brian. You know what the name is. I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, I, I know. Good morning, good morning, good morning, and welcome back to The Good Life with me, Eileen. We are here on Relationship Tuesday, and we are here to open your mind. We are here on Relationship Tuesday discussing the angry eye experiment. It was an experiment in which the blue-eyed people and the brown-eyed people were separated due to their eye color, and then one group was discriminated against. And then there was, you know, the... (laughs) What would you say? No, no, I was like, in in the experiment, when the woman comes back in, she storms back in the class, and she's like, what has somebody done to you? Exactly. All you have to do is apologize. You're this upset. All you have to do is apologize to the black people in the class that you offended by walking out on them. You mean, and she said, you mean I'm the not same thing that it. authority figures do to young black men yeah, every day and they apologize. want them to apologize, but she was too angry to apologize and she left rather than apologizing? Left. Just like a, a police officer. Oh, okay. It was an accident. <laughs> You shot somebody. Apologize. Not cover it up. <laughs> you know? Jane well, Elliott goes on to say that all white apologize. people are raised with some racist beliefs, even though they may not want to admit no, at it. A minimum. It's possible to recondition racist beliefs. I'm going to go to the lines. We have OT on the hotline. OT, welcome to the good life. I wish you were in the studio today. Good morning. OT. Good morning, OT. Class, division of extinction, the distinction of gender, uh, where you live, all of this division uh, exists, they have existed. I mean, the key that I found for our community is how we view ourselves. Um, Absolutely. In the African American community, uh, there's those who don't, who don't even identify with the African community. We use comments like those people, those children, uh, mm-hmm. that there are many who, until they're uh, uh, victimized. Uh, with uh, uh, racism in, in, in class distinction, uh, have never have, have had any, any really connection or empathy uh, for our community. So at the end of the day, you know how you feel about yourself and how you, and how you're equipped, whether it's from your family, your faith, or just uh, your innate ability to deal with uh, uh, the kind of person you are 
how you deal with it ultimately is going to determine how successful you are or aren't and how accomplished you are as it relates to dealing with those things that uh, like racism. Thank you, OT. You're always on point. You know, I'm a real you, and next time we have this conversation, you're going to be sitting in the studio. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. So how can we start to, I mean, number one, you have to have the conversation, which is what we're doing today. How can we begin to, how can we begin to, you know, tackle these, these types of ills in our community? I'm going to go to line two. Welcome to The Good Life with Eileen. You are here on Relationship Tuesday with the crew, Gian, Ty, Uche, and Brian. Good morning. Good morning. How are you doing this morning? We are All wonderful. Right. Yes, Absolutely. Thank you so much. Yes, sir. And you, you teach hatred. You teach that. You know? And of course, uh, every community uptown, uh, every neighborhood uptown, or downtown neighborhood, we had a neighborhood. And, then, and the people that live in that neighborhood know each other. And you do, your child do something wrong, guess what? He can beat you too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no. know. <laughs> people raised us. Absolutely, it was done as a community. Right. Thank you so much for your call. I'm going to get to the lines. We have Sekou on line three. Thank you so much. Sekou, welcome to The Good Life on Relationship Tuesday. We are discussing the angry eye experiment in which the blue-eyed and the brown-eyed were um, separated due to eye color, and then one group was discriminated against so that um, they could feel what racism feels like. Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> Well, you know what? I have three minutes left, so I'm going to let them respond to your question. Go ahead, guys, since since y'all are firsthand experience. So I'm going to say, first off, um, my experiences at Newman were wonderful for me. Um, because I can say for some of the same stuff I had to deal with at Newman, both of my degrees, my my bachelor's and my PhD, I went through some of the worst same, worst stuff at HBCUs. So I'm not going to put down Newman or Brother Martin or any other school for experiences that people put on you. But what I will say to the point about education is this. We have always been known to traverse divides and do things that have never been done before. So by going to Newman, Brother Martin, Jesuit, that wasn't anything different. All it was is a new opportunity that we had to grow through. But I will say... I, I can't, I won't tell the stories about what I dealt with at Southern and Jackson State, but it was no different. It was still people. And like I tell people about church experiences, the only difference between people in the church and people in the street is where you find them. Mm. Hello. I can say, um, Go ahead, Uche. I can say, through explanation, through my parents, it's been in 
My dad graduated from <clears throat> Harry. My mom graduated from Vanderbilt. So I had I got it on both sides, and both of them, one PhD, one doctor. But they wanted something better for me than they had for them, and that's why they put me in the school. Why would you want to put your children in the same position you were in? That was the whole point for you to be better, so you can provide your children a better opportunity than you had. So they can provide their children a better opportunity than they had and so on and so forth. Who wants to put their children in the same position that they were in? So you mean if you grew up in a two-bedroom house, you want your pet, you want your children to grow up and be in a two-bedroom house? You want their children to be in a two-bedroom house? Yeah, which, and we just <clears> talked <throat> about that. Unfortunately, right now, it's real, cause we live in reality for 2016. Yeah, right. The good schools in the city right now are unfortunately predominantly white schools. Yeah. Now we can, I know people call in and argue with me about that, fight with that about it, but that's just a reality. And I mean, we need to change in the city, but that's a whole other conversation. But as a parent, you want what you think is the best for your children. And unfortunately, at, at right now, today, reality is the schools that our children go to or what we deem is best. And unfortunately, sometimes they are predominantly white schools. And and just a, one more point. You know, back in the back in that day in the 50s and 60s, you know, look, it is what it is. Some people went to the schools they went to because they couldn't afford to go anywhere else. Mm-hmm. It's crazy. If you can afford to send your children to a better school, why wouldn't you? Yeah, I, I would just have to echo, echo you know, Gian's point that she just made as well. And my, my daughter um, is a product of, I'm a product of both public and private. She's a product of public uh, and private as well. She's currently in a public school. And if, if I had the, if, if I like to now to Uche's point, if you could afford to send your child to a better school, any parent that cares deeply for their child would do that. My last thought would last be that thought, when thanks. it comes down to dealing with the issues of racism, discrimination in our communities, we have to hold ourselves accountable. We got to act. So like we said on Dr. King's Day, it's not a day off, it's a day on. We got to get back on and start changing things. There you go. Yeah. And this is the good life. Um, Jane Elliott started this experiment the day after Mark, Dr. Martin Luther King was killed because she decided to do an exercise that would help her students understand racism. She says, white people's number one freedom in America is to be totally ignorant about those who are other than white. Their number two freedom is to, de- is to deny that they are ignorant. She wanted everyone to be aware of how the system works. She says laws are made to support white superiority, and when others catch on to how it works, then the system changes and laws are changed. She said she didn't invent this exercise. She learned it from Adolf Hitler. When people of color get tired of being exposed to racism, they can't just walk out because there's no place for them to go. Racism is based on power. People shouldn't deny differences. They should accept them and appreciate them. And that's The Good Life. So make sure that you follow us on social media, on The Good Life Radio Show on Facebook, Twitter, um, at TGL Radio Show, Instagram, at TGL Radio Show, because the link to her experiment is there. So you can watch the video for yourself and you can decide for yourself. Put yourself in somebody else's shoes. That's The Good Life. And today is $2 on Tap Tuesday at Gentilly Italian Pie. So make sure you go to 4706 Paris Avenue, home of Family Happy Hour, $5 wings, $5 personal pizzas, $5 drink specials. That's Tuesday through Thursday, 3 p.m. to 7 p.m. Dine in or carry out 504-826-9180 because that's The Good Life. See y'all tomorrow. Man, but we take shots. Man, look, I had my first semester. I almost thought it was a bad look.